Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to this latest event in our Newcastle Develop event series. Um, this month's our focus is the creative sectors or the creative industries. Uh, as with the rest of the series, we'll be talking about how, how you either start or progress a career within the creative industries, covering topics such as things like the biggest barrier for getting started, what the biggest opportunities in the sector are that are coming up. We'll touch briefly upon COVID um, and how it's changed the sector and, and things you might want to think about as well. And then we'll try and get to tackling as many questions as, as possible from those you've submitted and those that you might submit during the event itself. My name is Jeremy. I'm the alumni programs manager here at Newcastle. And as always for these panels, I'm, I've been joined by three, uh, three alumni panelists who all work in the sector and who've very kindly given up their evenings, or at least part of their evenings, to share their uh, experiences and their knowledge with, within the sector. So we're just going to quickly go around to get introductions and then we'll get started. So, uh, so Sarah, to start with you. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I am a short film producer and a freelance filmmaker based here in the Northeast. Um, when I graduated from Edge Hill University with an undergrad, I went to do a master's pretty much straight away under recommendation from my tutor at my undergrad university. Um, partly because I really enjoy the academic side of film and writing about the history and politics and how that ties into it but also because there was some great um, modules within the course that kind of ended up helping me get uh, contacts and get to where I am right now. Um, alongside doing my master's, I ended up group meeting with a group of local filmmakers who needed a producer. Um, so in the space of about a year while doing my master's, I also produced six short films, like one after the other with different writers and directors. Um, and then one of those films uh, was seen by a uh, talent exec with BFI Network. Um, and on my module for um, I Went to Go Did Work Experience at Sheffield Docfest, I met up with the um, execs based in the Northeast, well, based in the North, but there was also an exec in the Northeast. Um, and then it kind of went from there and they introduced me to a director and that's how I got my first funded shot with the BFI through a variety of different kind of connections and situations that both uh, doing a master's at Newcastle and um, just kind of making films got me to. Um, from that I also ended up doing a new creative short which is um, on BBC iPlayer called White Dwarf um, and that was funded um, as well I got up, uh, some funds for that um, currently and then we filmed the BFI one just recently so it's kind of stepping up and we're moving forward and most recently um, I'm working with Oscar winning um, company Slick Films to produce a short film with the director and that production company so that's quite exciting and uh, that's just kind of started this week. That's great. So all hands to the pump yeah. for you with uh, with all that work this week as well, which yeah. is which is absolutely great. <laughs> yeah. So um, alongside making the short films, I um, ended up kind of connecting with a lot of third sector organisations, and I did sort of documentaries actually with Newcastle University and with some of the departments. One of which on um, accessibility of toilets across the northeast, um, which was absolutely amazing to be part of um, as a study and as a filmmaker. It really helped kind of both with narrative and with general editing, because I also do some editing as a freelancer. So it's kind of doing lots of different things. <laughs> That's great. Um, I actually think we might be sharing that um, that short film about the accessibility of disabled toilets in the Northeast for our social justice month next month as part of my day of yes, action. So I, I believe it's on our website. So yeah, I was uh, filming that <laughs> and doing some. So there you go. A very happenstance, but great connection for, for, for me and for, for next month's ADOA, which is wonderful. Um, Sarah, thanks very much. Uh, Nick, Nick, to, to yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, good morning, no matter wherever you may be in the world. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Nick Fitzpatrick. I'm currently the Creative Services Coordinator at Universal Pictures. I've been here since 2015, uh, starting maybe three or four months after I graduated, graduated in 2015 after studying marketing. So kind of related, but wasn't necessarily the um, career that I was thinking about when I first kind of uh, got into studying marketing at uh, Newcastle. Um, how I kind of got into the industry, 
um, was, I'd say, almost by chance. And when I did kind of get a taste of it, I knew that this was kind of for me. Uh, during my second year, yeah, I, I'd, with uh, the marketing course, which many of you may be aware of, there is a um, optional uh, industrial work placement. And I wasn't going to do it. I wanted to do my three years, get straight into, you know, a job. Um, I love cars and all that type of stuff. So I thought that would have been kind of the industry that I was going to pursue. Uh, and early on in second year, two students came in who had just done a industrial placement. One person had done it at, I think, HSBC or 3M, one of these companies. And another person had done it at Warner Bros. So when I heard that they, they'd been at Warner, I was just like, oh, wow, it's not an industry I never kind of thought about kind of getting into working within film so that was it that was kind of in my mind so I went to Robinson's library I was there probably for about two months just sending off application after application but the two that I put the most effort into were Warners and Disney and I was fortunate enough to get an interview with Disney um, and I was even more fortunate enough to be offered the job two hours after the interview so uh, you know, I was uh, that fortunate uh, and, and lucky, I'd say, because I think um, there was about 50,000 people that applied for 100 jobs. So I don't know what the, the statistics are there. But um, yeah, so studying at uh, Disney for 12, uh, working at Disney for 12 months was brilliant. It was within the creative operations team. And they mainly dealt with um, uh, kind of uh, print. So it was a lot of the print artwork that was being distributed all over um, Europe. It was the Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, headquarters. Uh, and yeah, you were dealing with a lot of the uh, people based over at Burbank, which was in LA, the, the Disney head office, dealing with a lot of um, the filmmakers and quite the, the top execs and things like that. And you were getting exposed, even though it's an internship, they kind of make you hit the ground running. And I think it's really kind of, and you're in amongst it all, you're dealing with the publicity teams, you're dealing with the creative teams, you're dealing with the, the marketing. Uh, and these people are very high up, senior executives. Um, and yeah, it was it was very, very good. After graduating, I knew that it was, that was it. That's why I wanted to be in uh, film and within the creative world. Uh, so after uh, graduating, I started applying to many jobs and one of them being Universal Pictures. And I was, um, yeah, I, I got the interview. I, I was actually applying for a coordinator role, the coordinator role I'm doing now. And when I went in, it says, you don't have enough experience. So I was just like, ah, oh, right, okay, well, you know, I thought working at Disney would be, would be brilliant, it says, but we do want you to, in the team. Uh, would you be willing to do another internship? So it was something that I didn't want to do. I thought I've done the intern thing, uh, you know, I'm ready now to progress and uh, kind of level up. Um, but I thought I'll take what I can get. Uh, and within six months, I said, look, we can make you full time now. Uh, and that was that was brilliant. So, again, Universal is a great place to work where this side of it, it's more on the AV side. So any sort of trailers, TV spots, anything that you see on social media that comes through the team that we work in. So my team primarily deal with uh, localizing and distributing uh, all um, assets. So trailers, anything, anything you see for a campaign that might be, we, we deal with every market outside North America. So we're sometimes on some uh, campaigns, we're dealing up to 60, 70 territories. So it's pretty full on at times. Um, so yeah, that's how I got to where I am. That's great. That that I'll, I'll be honest. That sounds absolutely fascinating. And if uh, if you weren't doing uh, a more broader conversation, I'd probably pick your brain about how <laughs> about how that goes because it's um it's an area that I've never thought about before, but something that sounds that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, which is great. So uh, Nick, thanks very much. Um, right. and uh, and last but by no means least, uh, Louisa Louisa Rogers. Hi guys. Hi. Tough act to follow. Um, my name's Louisa. And I originally studied fashion photography and styling in London. I wanted to be a freelance fashion photographer. That's kind of really what I felt like my creative calling was. And I got there and my experience at the course just didn't really kind of match up with what I was envisioning. And that's kind of what led me to Newcastle because I got to the end of that bachelor's and I didn't feel kind of confident with the skill set that I had. And I knew that there was still more that I wanted to do and more that I wanted to explore. So I've called it creative entrepreneurship for the sake of ease, but the degree that I did at Newcastle was actually called um, arts, business and creativity. 
I think they've paused it for a year, unfortunately. So I'm really hoping that it, it does come back. And when I finished that, I actually won a grant through the career service to set up my business, which I'm sure exists in some incarnation, although perhaps it's changed a little um, since I got mine in 2015, 2016. So that's kind of how I set up my business. But my original idea wasn't the idea that kind of ended up working. Um, so I had a couple of years where I was really self-employed, doing any job that I could pick up. And I was actually a luxury cushion saleswoman for a couple of years. Um, so a bit of a random one. But I actually learned quite a lot uh, in that role because it was just me working directly with the designer. And we really kind of grew her company together. And that was actually really good experience for me to then kind of go back and apply that to my business ideas. Through working with the designer, we kind of set up a not-for-profit all about color. And we would host a lot of events, um, sometimes at Newcastle University at the Institute for Neuroscience. And basically I was asked to kind of come up with a talk on color and fashion. And I was like, I hate public speaking, but I also like a challenge. So I did it. And this woman came up to me at the end and introduced herself as the head of fashion at Northumbria and asked me if I had ever thought about lecturing. And I nearly spat out my lukewarm coffee all over her. I was so shocked. Um, and it kind of the rest writes itself. So I then started lecturing on the fashion communication course at Northumbria. I've since worked for uh, Newcastle University lecturing as well and uh, University of Sunderland, which has been really great. And uh, kind of through doing that, I've set up two businesses on the side as well, which I still run and, and mean a lot to me. But it's great because I have this really nice sort of symbiosis between the lecturing side of things um, and the business side. And I find that rather than kind of take away from each other they actually really kind of feed each other in its own way so I feel like I'm in a, a really good place and every single day is completely different so that's fantastic. <laughs> that sounds that sounds great and I think it's really it's really helpful and it's interesting to hear when people say well I, I did this and did my undergrad and actually I wasn't really that sure that it gave me what I needed so I went and did something else and and that's led me to the right to the right path which I think is a, a really interesting thing to to, to hear to, to know that you can do that you don't have to lock yourself in it 22 um and that's it um I will say that there are uh start I think they believe they're called startup or foundership Scott like um grants that are available they're available to students and i believe they're available to all graduates who are up to three years out as well to begin new business um new business ventures uh so if you are interested in in setting that up you can go onto our website which is ncl.ac.uk and just search for startup and, and there'll be the information there which is super helpful um so those are our three panelists which is which is really great um what we're what we're going to spend uh, some time now is just run into and some of the the big themes and big topics that, that cover progressing your career as you as you get your first steps or if you're thinking about going into a creative uh, industry we'll hit some of our big topics uh, and then we'll try and tackle as many of the questions that you have sent in um already uh you can either live type them in the q a and um, you can type them in the chat if you uh tag either um my colleague danica who's who's in there uh, and we'll try and pick them up as, as quickly as we can so to begin with, one of the topics that we've covered across all of these series um, is the question that is, what is the biggest barrier? And I know that's a very broad conversation, but what is the most, maybe most common barrier that, that you have encountered or you think people encounter when thinking about beginning a career in the sector or, or, or you know, progressing their career in the sector? Um, I'm going to reverse my, my, my order, so I'm going to come to Louisa first for, for a response on that one. OK, um, so I'm going to talk about fashion quite broadly. Fashion industry still includes loads of different sort of job roles. Um, it's not just kind of about design. It's everything fashion communication. Um, so I think a real issue that the fashion industry has is the unpaid internship. I think things are starting to change. Legislation is being put in place, but there is still a lot of pressure on graduates or on students to undertake unpaid placements. Um, and what I would say to that is, you know, it, it's great if you can afford to do that and you can get your foot in the door somewhere. 
but not to think that that is sort of the be all and end all because I think something that is very much valued in the fashion industry and probably across a lot of the creative sector as well is you know um people that have the impetus to kind of set up their own projects um you know we're all empowered now to be photographers to be documentarians we have these kind of palm-sized devices in our hands where we can really kind of show off our knowledge our ability to create content um our creativity and i think you know i would encourage you if you're not able to secure a placement that's going to kind of align you in the sort of industry that you want to go into to not feel disheartened but to kind of do something for yourself that aligns with where you want to be so it could be as simple as setting up an instagram around a certain topic you know experimenting with making some interesting videos maybe doing a podcast something like that these are all things that you can teach yourself um you know set aside a couple of evenings and even if it's not kind of professional production quality i think people want to see inventiveness they want to see ideas and they want to see enthusiasm for a subject and i think in the creative industries we have a bit of a privilege in that that is actually something that can really speak volumes for us and it's not necessarily about having very specific sort of placements or internships under your belt that then align with what you want to do that's great that that's really helpful um, something that i i will come on to after i've asked sarah and, and nick for their responses to this um, which we'll probably link in is how much of much that we dislike to talk about it is how much of an impact has COVID had on those things? Is it that people are starting to become more aware that their time, their experience, their effort is is worth more than than like their free time to give away their time for free? So that'll be something we talk uh, about as well in a little bit. Um, Mick, to you for for um, for your particular uh, any of the biggest barriers or most common barriers to people getting started. Yeah, again, like Louise is talking about fashion, I'm going to focus within the film industry. Um, and I think really what you kind of do come across is um, is experience and and uh, how to gain that experience. And I think, you know, somebody who's trying to get into this industry who hasn't necessarily done any of it before, it, it, it's, it's one of these things that you hear time and time again when you ask people's individual stories, you know, colleagues and things like that, they, they do take unpaid work for a, a certain amount of time or they take internships. But I'd say the, the best one to do um, is to, you know, it's one of these things that people don't re realize is creative agencies, you know, especially within the film world. You know, you see everything that we kind of put out there, the posters, all the um, uh, banner artwork, web media, or things like that. You'll see that and you think it comes from us. It's all the agencies that create that. Uh, so we'll kind of get our brief send it to the agencies and then they send it back. It's almost like living at home with your parents. You throw your washing downstairs and before you know it, it's back in your bed all neatly laid out and stuff like that. That's pretty much what we're, we are, we're doing with our creative briefs. We send them off and stuff like that. And the creative agencies, there's multitudes of them. And it's kind of the better way to do it because starting off in a creative agency, I mean, I, I've done it topsy-turvy from a lot of people that I work with. I have started in a studio and it actually happens that in two weeks' time, I'm leaving Universal uh, uh, Pictures to go and work at one of the largest creative agencies uh, outside North America uh, called Picture Production Company. And the great thing about working within an agency is you get so much more technical knowledge, whether it be, you know, just dealing with, uh, you know, creating a, a one sheet or doing all sorts of localized graphics for um or creating the graphics for a, for a trailer, uh, or even sitting in there with the editors in the editing suite, creating the trailers or the TV spots or uh, the social um, uh, uh, social content that we put out. Um, and you know they they take people thick and fast. And you know the more often or not, everybody that you'll speak to has done more more than five years within an agency. Uh, and again, they've probably worked at a multitude of them. Uh, because, like I said, you you get such a broad range of technical knowledge. So then, when you take it to your, you know, if you do want to work at a studio, for it, for example, you have you have that other side knowledge that they very much find uh, invaluable. And that's why so many people who kind of work in studios have had all that prior knowledge. So I'd say the biggest barrier is gaining that experience, but. There's so many avenues in, and I'd say the best avenues are the creative agencies out there. 
That's great. That's, that's really helpful to know. And I've, I'm speaking as somebody who doesn't know, I'll be honest and say very much slash at all about, about sort of creative industries. It's, it's interesting to hear that it's, it's these sorts of things to go, I, everybody I work with has done this already. And that's a thing. I think people like skip that and go, how do I jump straight from graduating straight into Universal Pictures or Disney or, and, and it's doable. I'm not saying it's not, but it, it's helpful to know that there are obviously a lot of other ways into the, into that particular industry, which is, which is great. Um, Sarah, finally to, to you, um, what are the biggest sort of barriers to, to beginning uh, work in your sector as well? Well, I suppose mine kind of follows on from Nick in many ways. Um, although, I've also never kind of taken the route that's either been told to me or expected. Um, so when I was in university, we were told, so I do producing. Um, I really enjoy it now, but when I was in university, I absolutely did not want to do it because I had a view of it that it was just paperwork and contracts, which part of it is. Um, I was also told that you had to be a runner and had to have connections and making those connections beforehand would be easier and it is easier but it's not what I did um in many ways it's all about kind of going out there or joining events also when I came to Newcastle as a master like as a master student um I went to like an event and I met some local filmmakers and I went to a few more events and eventually they invited me out for lunch <laughs> um and they had all known each other for about five years um so I was a bit of a newbie um, and ended up producing for them. And it was just like little short films. Uh, I think they did like something called the 48 film challenge, 48 hour film challenge. Um, and just kind of doing stuff like that really helps in your free time or in a weekend or just a couple of hours a week. So we met up on Thursdays um, in the evening for about two hours. Um, and that's kind of when we kind of ended up talking and planning these things. Um, but yeah, the barriers are, tend to be listening to what people tell you what you should. <laughs> I know what this is telling you and like taking that as like the only thing you can do. In fact, it's all about kind of think, yeah, that's one option, but also what else could I do or what could be a way around that or how could I do that? So even just going to a couple of film festivals, uh, York Aesthetica is an absolutely amazing film festival. It's quite easy to get it. It's just York on the train. It's in November. I think the tickets are sale now, actually. It's not crazy expensive um, for what it is. And uh, actually, it's a great meeting place for a lot of filmmakers at all different levels. Like the amount of times I'm just sitting in the audience watching some short films on, could be fashion. They've got a fashion uh, short film place there and music videos and all sorts and gaming now. Um, I'm just sitting in the audience ready to watch some short films and someone will strike up a conversation asking what I do or where I want to go or what I'm seeing. Um, and then you just kind of make connections through social media in that way. And then you kind of have a network yourself. So you don't have to have that network before or know someone. I came into this at knowing no one. No one in my family ever did film or anything creative like that either. Um, so I kind of came into this with a totally blank slate and through a bit of luck as well met the right people but you, you've just got to kind of be there and sometimes it's hard like networking can be hard or going to events can be hard but it's also online now there's a lot of like groups facebook groups and some great film facebook groups and on twitter in the northeast here uh, you just have to search in communities and just kind of get involved with that and you never know what's going to pop up that's great, thank you. I, I think one of the consistent messages that's come out from 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 all three of you and from every other event that we've we've run in this is that there isn't one set path into the career that you want, and that getting too narrowly focused on this idea of oh I've done X degree and I want Y job so I have to follow this specific set route doesn't work. Um, it works for some people, but not everybody. Even if you get onto that path, often it doesn't fit what you want to do or where you want to go with your career, and so it is just about 
broadening your horizons almost and looking around the the obvious ways into into things and the obvious routes to, to find the one that that suits you best and plays to your interests your passions um and everything else and your experiences so that you can you can get onto those um so thank you that's that, that's really helpful um one of the things that did come up that i, I know louisa mentioned which uh, and i know nick did which was around internships um and that kind of segues into much so we don't want to spend too much time talking about covid but obviously covid has a big impact across all industries and i expect the creative industries more than most especially in some specific sectors so what are the biggest sort of changes slash opportunities that have arisen because of the past 18 months um where do you think the uh the, the sector or the industry that you're working is going to go because of those things. I know Louisa mentioned things like people are starting to become more aware that they don't need to do an internship and that maybe those things are starting to change, that the expectation is you do a free internship first before being offered work. So it'd just be really interesting to see what other things, what other opportunities, challenges, changes are going to come up or have started to come up because of the, the massive impact it's had. Um, I'm going to go to Nick first. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, not to dwell on it too much. I think um, for us, everything just kind of ground to a halt uh, because it was like a global issue. So a lot of production just kind of stopped, all the theatres closed. So uh, we were twiddling our thumbs for about six months. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that was a challenge in itself. Just and, you know, again, we're not going to dwell on it too much. Um, but it was, um, uh, you know, it did. did cause a lot of people to be out of work and things like that. A lot of our creative agencies and, and things like that. No one within our uh, studio was furloughed or made redundant or anything like that. So, you know, we were quite fortunate on that side. But I would say, you know, one of the biggest opportunities that came out of it um, that uh, crept up in every single um, kind of creative media and digital meeting was the use of TikTok. Uh, you know, what was TikTok before before lockdown? I mean, you know, you look at a, a download chart and it's, you know, it's almost vertical of how many people downloaded it and started using it and uploading content onto there. So that was one of the major things that us as, you know, working in the film industry and in the creative sector that, you know, what how can we kind of completely jump on the back of that and use that? Uh, so much so that I think somebody else was kind of brought in to obviously just kind of help uh, as a consultant and things like that. So... Uh, you know, they're just, you know, we're never standing still, even when the world was standing still, you know, there's always things out there and always things going on. And I think that uh, that was, you know, great that we were able to kind of tap into that additional uh, kind of social media platform. Uh, and it's it's kind of, it, it's just now instead of, you know, when you're talking about when we're putting out content, we'd always say, yeah, YouTube, Facebook, you no, know, TikTok's now up, up there. So I think that's, you know, just... You know the, the world doesn't stand still and just because you don't necessarily fit into that round you know hole doesn't mean to say that your peg won't fit in there one day you know because there's always something that may kind of change so i just say that you know like that's where the future is kind of going to lean towards more and more social and more and more kind of kind of capitalizing on your audience uh you know from from the sofa uh, again, look at Disney Plus and uh, the amount of subscribers they, they they got globally. And they're over 100 million, 110 million now. When they were expecting that would take five years, it took 12 months. Um, so I think that the way that w the, the, the future of kind of the movie industry is going, there's always going to be a, um, a thirst for the theatrical experience, date nights and all that type of thing. Um, but at home is where it's happening. And if you're able to kind of tap into that sector and have that kind of um, kind of foresight, uh, that could be you know quite a, a, an interesting avenue to kind of pursue. And again, that's kind of that rolls into kind of the changes within within the industry. Um, you know, just to kind of name drop that about three years ago, three and a half years ago, we had um, uh, Steven Spielberg come to talk to us. It was about 150, 200 people. And he got asked the question of what the changes were within kind of his creative field and things like that. And he said he and a few other people were working on the home experience of virtual and augmented reality. And obviously this isn't 12 months. This could be five to 10 years. You know, it, you know it's, it's still, it's not tomorrow, but it's soon. Uh, and how to create that. So 
again, you know, you could look at developing your skill set in virtual reality, augmented reality, because that's where things go. I think, you know, I'm sure Louisa may see it in the fashion industry. People are able to kind of put things on top of them to see what they look like, you know, in certain outfits and things like that. Again, that's where, you know, that's where it's leaning towards. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, watch this space and it's going to constantly change and adapt. So it'll be interesting. That's great. It's actually one of the questions that we got sent. And I think this links in. So, um, so and Louise, you get a slightly more time to think about this one, which is, you know, how do you see, um, like digital interaction, but within like the live space developing. I think that's that's what we're talking about, which is not only how do you get greater interaction from from uh, with people at home and, and through social media channels, but it's how is now, how is the digital environment, how is the digital world now interacting with people's like lived experiences and how do you make the most of, of, of melding those two things, which is why it seems to be the, the real, real way forwards. It's fascinating that Steven Spielberg and co like, we're going to start working on augmented reality. That's a, that's an interesting one. Um, so Nick, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to come to you about um, sort of what are the biggest sort of challenges, uh, anything, any of the growth opportunities that have come out of, of COVID in the last 18 months. Yeah, so we were like directly hit by the first lockdown. We were due to film our BFI short uh, the very week that the whole country went into lockdown. Um, I had to put everything on pause um, for about a, a year, more or less, yeah, because we've just finished filming it. Um, but during that time, a few things started creeping in that I didn't expect. Uh, for one, there was lots of training for COVID supervisors within the industry. That was something... Uh, because the industry is quickly developing, figuring out a way of how to actually be able to film in the current circumstances. And that's still here now. Uh, we still have uh, guidance and not restrictions as such, but we've got to follow things that aren't for the rest of the public. So we've still got to wear masks, PPE and all sorts. Um, and COVID supervisors are a massive part of a set now. Uh, that wasn't a role that existed before. Um, I suppose it'll adapt as well. Um, so these people kind of have a job afterwards if that ever happens. Um, but yeah, the COVID, you can get training really easily and get free training from school, uh, skill um, screen skill, skill screen or something. I can't remember. Um, but also um, there's paid opportunities for training and you get a certificate and you can apply for those jobs. And it's a great way of getting on set and getting that experience without either being a runner, having connections or being in film uh, because a COVID supervisor doesn't need to have film experience. So you need to know a bit of it, but you can get on set and kind of help with that as well. So that's like the biggest thing that's kind of happened. Um, a new job has popped up um, and it's, we need more. There's always room for more COVID supervisors, it seems. Um, but yeah, we kind of stopped, but then I also got a job as an editor um, because other industries were also, um, I got edited with a company that their big, biggest client was NHS. So they were like, couldn't keep up with the work. Um, so while it seemed like everything was quiet, there's other areas that were starting to get busy. So I did um, like a Christmas video for the NHS. Um, and then fast forward to this year, we finally got round and put everything in place to film our BFI film. Um, did a bit differently. We got a bit more funding. Um, but it was a success, um, it was done, um, yeah, it, it, there's barriers, but again, there's always going to be barriers, whether it's with COVID or with uh, career path or with beliefs into how to do something, it's just a case of finding a way around it, and that's kind of also what a producer does as well, so I quite like doing that sort of stuff. Right. Um, I, 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 I guess a follow-up question I'd have is, would it be worth I suppose I can ask my question. Is, is it always worth having skills that cross cut? So you don't have to necessarily be super experienced in video production, for oh. example. And that's the only thing. If you're like, well, I can do these three things that cover a variety of roles, people are more likely to hire you because like, okay, well, you can you can fill that role and now you're on set, you can also do these things as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely like everyone. I recommend getting the basic COVID training because you never know when you're gonna need to step in if you want to do film. Um but also like understanding the editing process, read it. Like one thing that I never got told, but you should do if you're interested in film is just read scripts, go into like Facebook or so like any other social media and say, does anyone have any scripts? 
can just read. Um, you can access re uh, scripts that are like TV scripts on the BBC website as well from TV shows. And you can find like other scripts for like directors and famous films and kind of read how what works for them, read other people's script and give feedback to other people in order to understand your own work, if that makes sense. So that's also a great kind of thing to do if you can't go out there and do stuff, just kind of train, either get some free editing software, there's some great free editing software, uh, film little, there's a thing called Cine Haken, Haken, I can never say it. And you do like a little poem, but in visual form and you send it in um, and that's great to edit because you can get quite creative and teach yourself. So there's loads of things you can do if you can't get out or if you can't, if you can't, if you don't feel confident to go and socialize or network immediately, there's all stuff you can be working on in the background. Um, but yeah, there's definitely different kind of ways it goes right. in different skills. And um, I know someone that was on my master's who was a truck driver before taking a film um, like master's. They drove trucks for a living and now they're working with like massive studios. Um, as a location in a location department and they got in because they had that license to drive trucks so they started just by driving kit and crew and uh, props around and then they got the right connections through those little jobs and now they're like working on absolutely massive films and that was in like in the space of two years so any skill can translate into film that's like straight off the bat anything goes <laughs> Which is great. So that's that's useful to know rather than having very specific niche of skills. You can be as broad as you like. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, Louisa, to yourself, um, sort of any big changes, of, of course, many, but the biggest sort of changes and opportunities and challenges raising from, from like COVID and, and going forwards. Yeah, so I think, I mean, just to echo um, Sarah and Nick, you know, there for all the disruption, there have been opportunities that have sprung up to replace them. So, you know, uh, kind of, adjacent or overlapping with the fashion sector, huge opportunities in digital marketing. You know, we saw this exponential growth of e-commerce. Um, a lot of retailers that went online before the pandemic went online um, and that trend is continuing to grow. There are all these kind of inroads to that, um, you know, looking at kind of pay-per-click advertising, content creation, influencer outreach, again, all of these kind of new job roles that are being created. Um, Nick obviously mentioned previously creative agencies, and I think that really stands for um, fashion too, because again, the skills that you kind of cultivate in those job roles where you do have to be so dynamic, um, they're very transferable. And I, I think uh, one of the sort of values or paradigm shifts that we've seen as a result of the past year is that actually having an attitude, a kind of good attitude, motivated attitude, but also adaptability. So um, kind of being pragmatic, responding quickly to situations, thinking about creative solutions are a lot more valued now, perhaps, than they were before. Um, and I guess kind of speaking more generally or speaking more specifically about fashion, this idea of cultivating a skill set that uh, straddles fashion technology. So, you know, we're going to see a lot of changes in terms of the consumer retail experience. Um, a lot of that will be sort of supplemented by, enhanced by different technologies. Um, the blockchain, there's going to be loads of opportunities in that arena um, where that intersects with sort of the authentication, for example, of luxury fashion garments, but also in terms of sustainability, tracking the life cycle of a garment, where has it been made? Um, and of course, virtual and augmented reality. And, you know, that's not just something that can be used for the presentation of clothing. So it's not just big brands that are going to be using those technologies to present their kind of you know, spring, summer 2023 collection, but it's also for the design process and the design process in fashion has always been transnational. It's always been global teams, but now instead of, you know, hopping on a flight, going to Beijing to kind of consult on the new range and look at samples, that process is now entirely digitized as well. So I think even if you're not a kind of very techie person, if you have an understanding of some of those changes that are going on and you can kind of appreciate how those technologies are going to help some of the systems and processes within fashion, I think that's going to be quite valuable as well. So I would encourage anyone that's interested in fashion to kind of go and read up on those things, um, access some trend reports 
and um, I just kind of start to build a bit of a knowledge base in that area, even if you don't want to then specialize in that. That's really helpful. That's, that's really helpful to know. Um, and, I, and I do think it's something to, to echo that, that we've spotted a lot across these, across these events is that every sector has almost any job that you'd like to do. So you might come out with a finance degree and like, I'd like to continue working in finances, but I don't want to go to PwC. Well, films need financial producer need financial support you know universal pictures will have a financial department you know fashion houses have financial departments you can get a job in in the sector that you like with any almost any background and having that cross-cutting thing of okay well i i like fashion and i also do finance how do those two intersect intersect oh i've got a computer science degree and i like film production how do those two intersect is a really good way to find out those more niche less traditional ways into those sectors. So that's definitely something to, to, do, to think about, um, which is great. Thanks very much. Um, we've had a couple of questions come through while we've been uh, while we've been chatting, so we'll try and tackle those while we're here. Um, so one of, uh, one of the attendees uh, has asked, do you think the creative industry is doing enough to hire diverse people? And if not, how would you change that? Um, do you think it's essential to have a more sort of cohesive and diverse work environment? Um, I'm going to come to Sarah first for that one. Hi. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely more that can be done. It is being done, but there is definitely more that can be done. Um, from my point of view, it's a case of um, making sure people feel encouraged. Um, and this is going to be a change that everyone needs to work at as well, um, that people feel encouraged to apply for things that... Um, so for example, we put out a casting call and we make this casting call open to everyone. Um, but actually we end up just getting one type of person apply for it instead of the diverse amount of people that will want to apply for it. Um, and that's kind of a thing that, yeah, it's open to everyone, but I feel like a lot of people are feeling discouraged that, um, oh, they won't pick me or, oh, I'm not right for that but you don't know, you can't read people's minds. So on one hand, it is just apply for that, even if you don't think it's for you. But on the other hand, I feel like the whole industry and many industries, even outside of film, need to actually actively show that they are inclusive uh, by targeting, um, perhaps, or um, making people feel more welcome. Because um, that's definitely something that I've found, uh, not just in casting, just across crew as well when um like hiring um but also kind of representation um within hearing from people within those industries um not just like the people on front in front of camera or the people behind camera um it's just it's very complicated but yeah i think we just kind of need to be more encouraging um in in making people feel welcome because um, like, I know that from my experience, like people have been like, oh, this is very difficult. You might find this really difficult. Um, I don't think it's for you. That kind of spurred me on and that's the type of person I am. But a lot of people might take that to heart and be like, oh, that's really cool. But it's got like, I need to be really well organized. Um, I was told that I'm not very, I shouldn't be very well organized, but I am. Um, because I'm not very well at organising. I go above and beyond to be organised. So while I got told I'm not going to be very good at producing because you don't, you should naturally have these skills, um, you do have those skills. You've just got a different way of doing them. So that's from my point of view in diversity. Um, it's just being more welcoming and not putting barriers that aren't really barriers, just explaining what the situation is, but also saying, but, or however. It's not just, yeah, that's that's my point of view anyway. Great, uh, thank you very much. Um, I expect that's probably gonna be echoed by, by, by everybody else. Um, Louise, if I come to you next about the sort of the, the diversity aspect. Oh, yeah, um, so as I kind of said before, I think the real issue in fashion is sort of diversity of socioeconomic background um, because of some of those issues that I said before this 
expectation of free work and the fact that it's very London centric. So not only are you working for free, but you're paying quite a lot of money to go and uh, and live in London for six, 12 months and sort of do that. Um, and I, I think with fashion, because it's not really generally seen as a very stable or serious industry to work in. I mean, my parents were not particularly happy when I told them I wanted to go and do fashion photography in London. Um, they've since come around, but you know, it took a while. So I think one of the things that we can do to encourage more diverse candidates to apply for jobs, um, but also to set up their own businesses is framing fashion as a career like any other you know, one that employs a huge portion of the workforce um, in the UK, when you kind of consider the supply chain from end to end and all of those satellite creative job roles that kind of exist around it. So I think if we stop treating it like a sort of fantasy job that doesn't exist out there in the real world and emphasize that you can have, you know, security um, prospects, career progression within the fashion industry, I think that will help. Um, and I think if you're willing to be, sort of adaptable and you're willing to also work in areas that have quite a commercial focus, there will certainly always be opportunities out there for you. Um, I guess one of the cool things about the fashion industry, women are overrepresented at entry level. Um, that tends to very much kind of pan out to averages across other sectors once you get to management level. But I do think that because fashion is quite sort of cutting edge and open minded, it can certainly be um, a more kind of open industry for people to get into. But I, I do think that kind of uh, socioeconomic um, discrepancy of people going into it is sort of the main issue that we need to address. And it, it's starting to work with some of those kind of checks and balances that are being put in place to stop that exploitation of young people working for free. And I, I think that's a process that will take a few years, but positive changes afoot. So. Good. And, and I really like the idea, which I think it should be echoed, is that you need to frame jobs in practical terms. It's not just this fantasy, oh, you want to go into fashion and do X. It's like, well, think about the whole process. Look at the jobs that you can do that that at, at ground level and, and how you create an entire career, not just, oh, you're going into, going into film, you'll never make any money out of that. Well, that doesn't really cover the plethora and multitude of, of job opportunities and, and the way that you create a career. I think that's a really good point to give people the ideas of a practical career path rather than just this one-off fantasy shot that, that people don't understand. I think that's a really good point to make. Um, Nick, to, to yourself um, about diversity in the, in the work environment. Yeah, I think just kind of, again, talking from, a, from my perspective, I think Universal has been very kind of... Um, proactive that's definitely in terms of being obviously very diverse and things like that uh, shatter any sort of glass ceilings you know knock down any barriers and things like that you know there is a lot of um, kind of groups within NBC you know maybe fall into you know the BAME community or you know like something you know that kind of helps um, young aspiring kind of new females coming into the industry and kind of progress and things like that and I think the, the biggest thing, not just within, you know, the, the creative industry or the film industry, I think right across the broad is just education, right? And I think that I think that the more people get educated, especially after, you know, the terrible things that happened last year with George Floyd and things like that, these kind of groups became so apparent uh, and everyone was sharing experiences and things like that of how they get into the industry and things like that to kind of just show that, you know, it's it's not just kind of a, you know, uh, 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 one trick pony just for a certain type of people to come in or anything like that it was kind of very interesting to get um, some filmmakers involved in that as well uh, it was um, I forget her name Nina DaCosta who has just uh, um, directed our uh, Candyman film I think she also directed um, the Marvel film I forget it uh, Black Panther so she came in and she also spoke about, you know, how to break in the industry if you're a young female or even a young female of colour. And it was just kind of, yeah, again, it's and she was echoing the same words, education right across the board. And I think a lot of workshops have been set up over the past year uh, for any any background to come in and just kind of hear the stories of anybody who wants to share their story of how they got into the industry or any sort of barriers that they they've seen and how to overcome that so it's it's I think um it's 
yeah, it's just kind of being uh, as transparent as possible, really. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's really good to hear. And I, I think maybe something that, that people can look out for is those companies that are overtly making those steps. And I think if companies are, are, are keen to, to show that they're, they're working on education and, and increasing their diversity, then they're a company that are trying to be a more diverse environment and i do think it's a it's a learning curve for both employers and employees and one that especially new graduates young career um uh young career individuals have a real chance to um progress and develop from the ground floor because they're bringing in those sort of experiences and expectations that the environment need, the work environment should be more diverse and more cohesive and more inclusive um and i think that can really be a good thing so i think it's one of those things that's a bit of a i don't want to say two-way street maybe symbiotic both from from people pushing the agenda and companies learning from people to say you need to do this sort of stuff um so that's really helpful um that's great um there was another question that came through um from uh, from somebody who's watching which said um i graduated from architecture this month i have a real interest in illustrations and art and i do have an instagram page but how do i find better connections and better work opportunities and i guess this kind of conversation is how do i grow my network to to find like to to get my myself off the ground um nick i'm going to come straight back to you for that for that question yeah i mean yeah I, i'd just say that the the best thing to do is to shamelessly reach out to people uh whether it be on instagram facebook uh you know you, you've got linkedin you know i think that that's just such an important thing to do because it's not necessarily, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story of how I got a, probably the, the best kind of reference I could I could have asked for, that when I applied for a job at, uh, for the job at Universal, I obviously HR contacted me. They said, oh, you'll be interviewing with um, so, such and such, and they put two names. So again, uh, as a lot of people do these days, I, um, I just stalked them on social media and I saw that uh, one of the people that I was having an interview with, I worked with at Disney. So I reached out to uh, this lady, Daryl, who worked in publicity. And I said, you know, I've got an interview coming up. Uh, could I possibly, um, you know, could you do whatever you could? You know, I said, you know, I, I, apologies for just reaching out for that. And she was like, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll just, all she said was just leave it with me. So that was that. I went in, had the interview, uh, subsequently got the job. And it wasn't until after I kind of had the role that I found out that she um, wrote a big email to my um, uh, to be manager. Um, she wrote a big email to another person within Universal Pictures and another person who worked at the creative a creative agency. And they all kind of saw this email, contacted uh, the, my hiring manager, the manager who was hiring me, saying, oh, uh, "I believe you had uh, somebody coming in." um for an interview uh, i've just had a great reference for them so she had three references for me before i even walked through the door and that was because obviously I'd, i i had worked with them but it was because i'd shamelessly added so many people on social media that i was seeing who was friends with who so i was able to go well they you know by some degree they know each other so let me reach out to them let me see what they can do and i think that probably secured me the role more than anything else so i think that doing that is definitely important. And again, going on and searching companies on LinkedIn, uh, going through, you know, and see who's who works where, doing what, add them, reach out to them, speak to them. And uh, I think one of the most important things, I think with anything is be resilient. Uh, if you get a door slammed in your face, don't put it off, don't let it put you off. If you have someone who's just gonna ignore you or be very kind of like direct and not necessarily helpful, don't let that put you off to speak to the next person or speak to them again, you know, uh, and just reach out and just say, thank you very much for the time, you know, just or go for a cup of coffee or anything like that. I think that uh, that's, it, it, it's more powerful. And I think people realize, and I think what holds us back is kind of a, an element of fear. So, yeah. That's really helpful to know. Thank, thanks very much, Nick. And I, and I, I totally echo that the ability that growing a network is, almost an organic experience for yourself um, and you have to find out a what works for you but also just to not be afraid about reaching out to people and, and making those connections because you never know what connection is going to be your next sort of helping hand or, or, or foot in the door or however you want to say it um louisa if i ask you about that as well about how you sort of create create a network um, um and and sort of look for work opportunities 
So I think um, one of the things I see kind of with our students as they graduate is that they'll kind of put stuff out there and be like, no one's talking to me about my work. Um, it, it's a whole other process and a whole other step to then kind of be proactive about putting what you've created out there um, and to be proactive about your networking process. Um, you know, the algorithm is working against you, unfortunately. So there's definitely an element of actively reaching out to people, doing some research, um, you know, asking people for feedback on what you have, asking people, you know, for five minutes, for a coffee, whatever it may be. Um, I've had meetings with people that I just thought were really interesting and they might not have even been in my sector, but there was just something about them where I kind of clicked with them and I just said, look, I would love to just have a 15 minute chat. Most people want to help. Most people are very flattered that you're reaching out to them. Um, and most people will go out of their way, even if it's just to give you some very general advice, bounce some ideas off you, make things as easy as possible for busy people. You know, if you can just have a one click link, you know, include that in your introductory email. You're not kind of jumping the gun. Um, but if you send an email saying, hi, I'd love to show you some of my work, that person then has to respond and say, OK, cool. Where do I see your work? Then you send another email, cut out that interaction for them. So make it very simple, make it instantaneous. Um, like Nick just said, uh, follow up, you know, um, basic politeness, basic professionalism goes a really long way. And if you don't get a response right away, don't assume that that's necessarily a no especially in the creative industries, people tend to be very busy um, and they can also sometimes, you know, be working on lots of different projects. And it might just be that they've lost track of you, that they've read your email, they wanted to respond but forgot to. So I always recommend maybe leaving it a week and following up and you'll find most of the time that you do then get a response. Uh, pick up the phone. A lot of people don't like that, um, but that's how one of the girls that works for me in one of my fashion businesses found me when she was just 15, 16 and wanted to do a week of work experience when she was at school, she actually rang me. Um, and I thought that was really um, sort of confident of her and very bold. And I thought there aren't many 15, 16 year olds that would just kind of cold call someone and say, hey, I love what you do. I'd love to come and kind of learn from you. So straight away, I was very kind of keen to get her on board. And finally, you know, you'll hear this phrase bandied about a lot. It's not what you know, but who you know. A lot of people uh, find that disheartening, but I actually think it's great because you actually have power over who you know. So you have the ability to influence who you know and actually cultivate that network. It's just a case of going out there and doing doing it. So again, whether that's stalking people on LinkedIn, going to networking events, whether those are online webinars or um, sort of IRL in real life. Um, if you're an artist, perhaps looking at open submissions to different art exhibitions, um, you know, keeping track of sort of local galleries, what sort of stuff are they putting out there? Can you kind of just speak to someone, even if it's, um, you know, someone at the reception desk that might then refer you to someone? ask for feedback, be open. And yeah, it's all about getting your foot in the door. And when you're talking to someone in a sort of networking setting, even if you feel that they might not be very useful to you, try and kind of be polite, try and have that conversation with them. Because what I've learned in my sort of five or six years out in industry is even if they can't help you directly, they will very likely know someone who can. So it's really that kind of degrees of separation, friend of a friend thing. And if you are, you know, a pleasure to speak to, if you're polite, if you're um, sort of uh, grateful for people giving their time and their advice, then I, I think that will kind of do a lot for you um, and you'll reap the benefits of that. And it might not be overnight, but networking is not about instantaneous rewards. And there might be people that you've met during your degree that a couple of years down the line end up being really useful. There might be people that you meet and the next day something comes through. So I think it's also about trusting the process and knowing that, you know, it, it's not just an easy kind of one, two, three step. Yeah, being engaging and memorable in, in, in when you network is is a, is is a skill, but it's a vital skill because people will remember you if you are polite and engaging and, and thankful when they talk to you. Um, one really quick thing I would mention before, Sarah, I ask you the question is, while LinkedIn is super useful, 
it's not the be all and end all of social of social channels. If you find people who are doing great stuff on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, any of those channels that you use, reach out. Almost all of us have direct messaging opportunities. You won't have to then go find that person on LinkedIn. And sometimes people respond better or more quickly to those kind of direct messages, which you can then take offline. So make sure that you diversify what you're using. Um, Sarah, just uh, just quickly to you for, for this final bit about um, uh, yeah, creating your network and, and looking for, for job opportunities. Yeah, so it like you say, it's creating a network. Um, often there's networks already there. Um, some of them are quite hard to break into. Um, as I can ask the illustrator, um, people like to li uh, be listened to. Um, so reach out and ask them about their stories. That will really stick with them um showing an interest in them and then they'll start asking about you um but also kind of looking where else that might be so it might not be with illustrators um illustrations are massive like a massive sector in itself um and it touches on like books children's books and um, film um like it, storyboards um obviously fashion everything our illustration can touch every industry <laughs> uh, products um even advertising um so kind of go out and if you see that there's something that's not there there's other people that feel like it's not there so um create yourself if there's not a network there already there's other people also looking for that network so kind of comment or like and um, ask people questions about their work and that'll end up being returned and then you might end up forming a little group um i know of an illustration group not in the northeast it's through someone i follow and they just kind of liked and commented on each other's work and they go out um once a month i think and do like a picnic and do some illustrations um or have different events within themselves um so it's it's not also just about breaking into a network it's kind of creating a network and community as well, because there's always people that feel like there's something not there and they'll join you. You're not alone. Yeah. And do you think, um, I do think just one final, one final, really quick point. One of the things that's come out really strongly from this conversation and others is that you have to be proactive about building that work. Um, everybody is, is doing the same thing, looking for the same thing. Lots of people are on LinkedIn. If you just, put something out there and wait for people to find you it might happen but it, more often than not that that doesn't that's not the case so in order to maximize your chances of, of making those connections finding those work opportunities um creating those networks be proactive you know go out and and even digitally meet people um because that makes the that makes all the difference um, I've got one question very quickly and then we'll wrap up. And this is very specifically for Nick, which was one of the questions from, from, a, from a, an attendant, which is um, how excited are you specifically for the new James Bond film, which after obviously 18 months of delays is coming out very soon. Yeah, it's, it's been an absolute roller coaster, uh, that title. I mean, yeah, starting off with, uh, it's been cursed really. I mean, we had Danny Boyle coming in and it was supposed to originally be released uh, what Valentine's 2020 and then it got pushed to, April 3rd or something like that. Um, what I'll say is how excited are you? Because I'm very fortunate to have already seen the title. Um, so I would say that if you're a James Bond fan and if you're a Daniel Craig fan, yeah, you'll enjoy it. So uh, yeah, um, expect good things. That's all I can say. <laughs> Great. That sounds, that sounds um, excellent. Uh, I'm excited. For, I'm personally very excited for it. Um, I love me a James, a good old fashioned. I don't want to call it a spy movie. James Bond has kind of become an action hero. But hey, um, we won't get it. We won't get sidetracked into that conversation. Uh, and sadly, that's that's all we've got time for. We've actually gone over our, our hour. And, and to be honest, I could happily talk about this for another hour or so. Um, I think we've only just touched the touched the surface on a lot of these topics. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, who've given up your time and knowledge and expertise this evening. It's it's always great to hear from alumni with their, their own experiences. Um, thank you, everybody who's attended, who's who's watched and who's submitted questions and who's been involved. That's really great. Uh, a really quick uh, mention, as you can see in the background, we do have our Alumni Day of Action next month. It's a whole month of events themed around social justice. You can go to our website, which is ncl.ac.uk forward slash alumni. It's on the homepage. 
there are events across four different aspects, um, including another developer event about di neurodiversity and inclusion in the workplace. So if you're interested in those, please visit and have a look and sign up. Um, we've got some absolutely fascinating speakers. Um, again, thank you very much for, for attending, for taking our time. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we're about to launch um, a really quick poll that just gives us some feedback on how the event has gone. Um, and apart from that, I hope to see you all at another event soon or maybe on campus in the near future. Um, hope everybody stays safe and as well. Um, goodbye and, and good night.